Are we sound only on this, or are we or are we picture as well? Uh just sound. I the picture I think is just more for us if, if yeah, uh, to see to see that there are other human beings there. Um, yeah, okay, you know, guys with beds with blue toys on them. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, those are uh, slimes from uh, Dragon Quest. Perfect. Did you have to give the. Fo- I I I'm also not. I also don't know. Oh my god, that's, that's so sense. great. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh. Okay, we could we could get started whenever, unless you want to go through more sure. stuff on your bed, Steve. No, um, that's fine. There's too much crap in here. So. <laughs> Hey, and welcome to Opla. The welcome to Opla, everybody. Opla, we got some Opla. <laughs> um, you're like, who are these voices? What's happening? Um, Delaney and I are. Steve hijacking. sounds fucking weird. Steve, <laughs> the the voice training that you've been doing has been fantastic. It's it's crazy. I know you're trying to like branch out so you can do sillier voices all the time, but this one, I'm really impressed. Yeah, you know, me, Steve Yurko, uh, one of the hosts of the One Piece podcast, more specifically Opla, the show about the Netflix, how the hell do I, Steve Yurko, put it? The show about uh, got it. the Netflix One Piece with real people, live yeah, real people, they, flesh they bodies Yeah, they made a flesh and blood. They made a, a flesh piece. <laughs> made a flesh and blood and human body parts. Welcome to Opla. Exactly. Delaney, I think that they should just give the show to us. Um, like the main show. That they should. And all the time. And we should just have control because Th- who wants to this listen to my plan. guys talk, you know? Who who really wants to? Nobody. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm filling in for Steve for our brief little introduction because Steve is uh, is busy with another podcast. I don't know if he's doing that right now, but he's... I figure it's worth plugging. You know... When Ken in the Barbie movie is like, my job is just beach. His job is just podcast. Um, His job I, is just podcast. Yeah. Um, so anyway, don't want to keep you too long. Um, Steve and I don't actually have a segment this week uh, because his job is just podcast, except for we have opposite schedules. It's been a little crazy between my job and his pods. Um, but next week, we'll be back. and We'll have more. I know it's been a couple weeks, um, whatever. <laughs> but we do have an interview with Delaney. Give it, give us a lowdown on on Mark Yobst. Mark Yobst. Uh, so Mark Yobst is going to be one of the directors of the Netflix People live action One Piece, <laughs> um, and the the People version, the normal People version, um, and it's actually a really really interesting listen. I've been getting bits and pieces. By the way, context for why I'm here because we haven't actually said. Yeah, Delaney's I'm, been I'm doing editing. some very beautiful editing work for us. Uh, you know, making sure nobody can hear any of our farts and stuff, or adding farts. Um, but I I've been I listened to little bits and pieces and I I have to say I haven't watched any of the have you you've done the whole series right Vero yeah uh, you've watched it you yeah I would just say yes series. you have you not watched the live action yet no <laughs> no <laughs> no no it's okay not yet. you you know what you and I are really busy we're, pe- we're peeling back the curtain here we're busy with Baldur's Gate what else is there we're busy with Baldur's Gate so there there's is. a lot yeah. going on. There's a lot going on in all of them. You are have to kiss a men. pretty I'm vampire. Sorry. I need my strong druid elf boyfriend. We don't have time for One Piece anymore. So I I don't like admi- I don't like admitting that I did have to go after editing a wonderful, very in depth interview from the lovely Mark Yobst about his experience directing One Piece, the live action series with people. Um, instead of going to watch live action series people one piece um i just went looking for holly oaks footage because i needed it for Baldur's gate reasons <laughs> um so i'm not proud and i'll get there but i will say that this stretch of interviews has had me really really interested because you know oda oda is kind of the the grand poobah of one piece it's his baby so there is a sense of um when you're getting new people into it that kind of like you know you're not my real dad that kind of thing <laughs> But everyone just seems so nice and positive, so oh, I yeah. think you guys are really going to 
you're really going to enjoy this interview. Yes. If you've enjoyed the stuff we've already had. And I think there's more coming. I don't know if we've announced them, but there's a lot to look forward to from from Opla. <laughs> um, Zach is going to fire us for talking about... <laughs> Baldur's Gate instead of One Piece. And... <laughs> but you know what? I'm, ge- I'm actually getting messages. I'm getting messages from Zach right now. It's like anyone. He's like, you guys have been going for a while now. Talking. How long does it take to record an intro? <laughs> Who's fucking talking about the gay vampire on my pirate show? I think uh, they should put a gay vampire in the pirate show. I guess. I'm kind of. Well, I'm Mihawk, surprised there isn't already one. I was about to be like, wait, yeah. do we have a vampire in One Piece and I've forgotten? See, it's it's like that scene in SpongeBob <laughs> where he's like, we got to shred everything. It's only fine dining. But I'm the fine dining for Asterion. So. Yeah. Also, yeah. Oh, whatever. We're off topic. Anyway, um, please enjoy <laughs> the interview. Um, and we will see you guys on the other side. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have a very special guest with us uh, today. But first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Zach. I am one of the hosts of the podcast, Steve. Also a host. Also a host, yes. <laughs> Sam, also a host. <laughs> of sorts. I'm, of sorts. I'm like um, a sub-host. And we are just absolutely uh, thrilled to introduce uh, one of the... I should have gotten the made sure I was going to get the pronunciation right before we started, but one of the directors uh, on Netflix's uh, One Piece, we have Mark Jobst with us. How's it going, Mark? Good. It's actually, it's Mark Jobst, but uh, I knew I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mark I'm, I'm Jobst. So used Sorry to, about the that. The Americans always says Mark Jobst. Yeah, welcome, Mark Jobst. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we don't know how to pronounce anything here. Yeah, you well, gotta I, love Zach's commitment Jobst to just fine. doing it Jobst on air. You should have heard some of the things I was called at school, so uh, nothing's quite as bad as what you said. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Um, first, I, I just want to hear how you got into directing, and, and you know, I, I know it's a very broad question, but just what, what brings you to where you are today? Wow, what a, what a question. <laughs> um, so I studied agriculture at university, um my dad was a cowboy uh in africa and wow. um so, so we have a long way to go to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> guys. um and so when we moved from africa to to the uk um you know i was i was wanting to you know be my dad's son and so i you know used to earn my pocket money breaking in bulls and you know, breaking in cows so that we could, you know, take them around the auction ring and um, and lived the life. And so and studied agriculture to to kind of, you know, to please dad, really, in many ways. Um, but I always loved story. And so I chose a university, Newcastle University, which is up in the northeast of England, where I knew the Royal Shakespeare Company used to tour for three months every year. And whilst they were up in Newcastle, they would do... Um, training sessions with the students, workshops. So I thought, well, I can study agriculture and get a degree, but at the same time, secretly, I can study theatre and acting and storytelling with the Royal Shakespeare Company whilst I was there, which is exactly what I did. And then at the end of my degree, um, I'd done quite a few shows with the group of people there at at the university, and we formed a a theatre company called the Three Monkeys Theatre Company, um, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and um, it suddenly took off, and we were suddenly funded and financed, and we were touring, um, and we were up on the road, and we bought an old ambulance van from an auction market for two hundred and forty quid, I think it was, and we stripped it down on the inside, and we filled it up with all our kit, and we toured around the country doing doing these shows, and then Tom Richardson, who's a very talented director. Um, who I formed the company with, he and I wanted to go in different directions. And so I split, um, we split the company and I ended up doing a one-man show in London as an actor for 
about 18 months, which is exhausting. Um, you know, every night doing on your own on the stage, doing the show, and I needed to earn some money. And so that's when I started to move into television um, and the sort of the, the full time kind of filmmaking, directing journey began, um, starting off in documentaries, um, using the science background that I had to, to direct those and then making my first kind of sort of live action half hour film uh, about a blind goat shepherd. I don't know. Can you be a goat shepherd? Yeah. Anyway, a yeah. goat <laughs> man <laughs> on a little island of the south coast of Ireland. And that began this process of how you put together uh, a story in film, even though it was in documentary, same kind of thing. <clears throat> and then I wrote a short film and um, got it made, won a few awards, and I was up and running. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's you, you know, storytelling is, you, you can, you can, you, you're always learning, whatever, whatever medium you're working in, if you're interested in storytelling, whether you're making a theatre show or whether you're making a documentary or whether you're writing, I used to write quite a bit of comedy and, and, and drama for radio too, um, you're always learning about structure. Um, and, and when I was working in radio, the extraordinary thing about radio is that you, you only have sound and the pictures that you can create in an audience's mind. So if you get your structure wrong, you lose your audience completely. So you learn so much about structure. And then, you know, when you put all those things together into live action, you know, all the experience that you have as a theatre director where where you, your your tool is the actor. You only have a wide shot. So unless you unless you learn the ability to work with actors, your wide shot's going to fall flat. So that's what you then take into, you know, when you're doing, you know, really complicated shows like One Piece, the most complicated show I think I've ever done. I could imagine. So, but the, so I guess, how did you get involved in the One Piece project? I mean, I know it has been going on, the pre-production was going on for around like six, five or six years before production even started. Um, but what was it like getting involved? Well, it was one of those things where, um, to be honest, I didn't really know very much about One Piece. Um, I, I knew of its existence, but I wasn't buried into it. And then um, Tomorrow Studios made contact with me, I think, through Matt Owens, who is one of the co-showrunners. Matt and I, I directed one of Matt's episodes for Luke Cage for Marvel Studios. Um, and Matt wrote a really wonderful episode for Luke Cage that was you know it just had so much um, warmth and humor and um, all, all those things that One Piece has but it was then applied to Luke Cage which is a, a bit of a kind of more visceral grittier world um, and that episode had turned out really well and I, I loved working with Matt and I guess he might have put my name to tomorrow to say hey you should have a chat with Mark about this you know so um, I, I was cutting a show in Los Angeles, and they said, do you want to come and have a chat about One Piece? So I said, yeah, let me just read some scripts first and and and, and, and let's meet. So I read um, I read a couple of the scripts, early scripts, and and we sat and we, met, we talked, and I did a bit of research. I loved the scripts. I felt they were really unusual. You know, I've, I've done quite a lot of big world building shows and what I loved about Matt and Steve's early scripts was that they were they were big, they were epic, they had scale, they were kind of definitely, you know, launching out into big worlds. But they also had these really beautiful, lovely, intimate moments between characters. Um, and you don't always get that in, in, in big shows. Sometimes they get lost and... And, and they really held on to those. So I really loved that. I was really intrigued by that. And so, you know, listening back into, you know, reading back into the manga and going back to the source and reading those materials and then sort of understanding the world a bit was um, really exciting, actually, not knowing about it. So when we met, 
I remember one of the very first things that we talked about was I asked them why why do it as a live action? Um, because the manga is so brilliant and the anime is so successful. Um, I felt like we needed to really have a reason to go into live action other than, you know, potentially you can make a lot of money out of it, you know, which <laughs> frankly is true. But, you know, as a director who's trying to kind of bring this whole thing to the screen, particularly the, the lead director, it, it ain't enough. Yeah. Um, I've, got to, I've got to have a stronger reason to, to, to be doing these kind of long 14, 16, 18, our days to be away from the family for you know months and months at a time and all that you've got to you've got to know why you're doing this show so we had a long conversation about that which was really really interesting very fundamental to me wanting to be involved um uh steve i i'm, I'm curious if you're at liberty at all to say what were some of the things that uh convinced you to uh go ahead and and be like yeah um, you know what we we do it was like i think this live action one piece yeah you know, should happen so what happened was um i'd been called in to come into the witcher um and and do some reshooting of the pilot episode you know um and to to come in and then do the finale for the witcher i'd been involved in in Jupiter's Legacy, uh, that the, the origin story and the finale of, of Jupiter's Legacy, and they're very, very big shows to make. And and what you realise is, as a director, when you first start out, you're trying to get a job, and so you try and work out what it is that they might be wanting from you, you know, and you, you know, you start your interviews and your meetings and you listen to what they're saying you try and navigate your ideas into what it is that you think that they want by the time i came out of those shows and having done you know a good few years in the industry you end up thinking you know i've got to just tell them what i think and get the job on the basis of what i really believe rather than what i think they might want from me um, you can't go into a show like this um, pretending. You've got to go in really believing. So my pitch to them was to say, look, this show means a lot to so many different people beyond it just being a great read and a great characters and wild situations. It means something to people. Um, and, and that was borne out when we started casting. You know, so many actors came in and said, this is this one piece has seen them through some really dark times. Um, so what is that? And it was really interesting to me that, you know, in 22 years, they never find the one piece. They've still never <laughs> found the one piece. And yet still the show goes on and still people love it. So to me, that said, that's because the treasure's inside you. <laughs> the journey is about the discovery of the treasure that's inside us. Now, Odison might have a very, very different idea about that. And he might say, no, 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 it is about the treasure. And maybe coming up soon, we will be finding the treasure. But in the meantime, you know, the journey is the thing. And of course, Luffy is a character who never really knew his mum. He was abandoned by his dad. He was bullied by his grandpa. And he... He wants to find a family and the crew becomes his family and he wants to come together. He wants to, to bring a crew together of people who who believe in him, who help him believe in his dreams and realize his dreams and who he also helps to realize their dreams. So those for me were really big universal values that transcend continents, nations, people, language, uh, difference. They're just human. So in, in taking on a show like One Piece, for me, 
not wanting just to make a show that was going to work for the fans, but wanting to make a, a show that would broaden beyond the limited fan base, you have to go to universal human values. Those things that an audience will will recognize and resonate and relate to. And that's what I felt like from the early readings to the scripts, from a deep dive into the One Piece manga, to to an understanding of what it was that fans loved about this show so much. That's where I felt this show could sit. And that became really exciting for me to try to uh, to be involved in. I have I'm so I think we've talked to a lot of people and parents and, and that had not um had any exposure of One Piece and you hit I think on two of of the points um the the sentimental one of um the character's growth and also just about how I think there was the Whoopi Goldberg quote recently about uh the the show being just this joyful experience which I think you all really do capture. I think that is a rare thing in media these days, particularly. The second thing is they never find the One Piece. It's been 40, however many years. Um, and it I, it is it does sound cliche to say, you know, the journey is the destination, uh, the destination, whatever. The journey, the journey is the, is the, the treasure. Yeah, mm-hmm. sorry. Um, but it it is true, I think, for for One Piece fans, and I'm I'm glad to see whether or not Oda, as you said, whether or not Oda Sam believes it. Um, you know, these characters bring us through dark times, and they go through dark times, and we're there with them. And just the 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 length of time it's been out. Uh, you know, I think Steve started reading when you were like 17, or whatever no. it was, <laughs> or 19, or 16. I don't know. 20? Younger than that, but oh, I didn't know which direction you wanted me to go. Uh, what was it for you, Steve? What was it? What was it for you, Steve, that kept you reading? Um, I well, it it I was reading the series for a couple years, and like it, we used to read it. Uh, I used to read it in a magazine called Shonen Jump, uh, and there was a bunch of other manga series in there too. And I think I liked some of the other manga series a little bit more at the time. But I think what I always gave it props for was just its, it was just how imaginative it was. Yeah. And I, I, I grew up watching, you know, animated Disney films, and I think what I liked about One Piece, I'm like, oh, this is like, this is like manga Disney. Um, <laughs> and but then eventually, as the cast started to broaden, I was like, okay, all right. It's like I, I'm starting to, you know, get more invested. And then for the series, like it. And it's like I don't know how far you got, but like it might be material fi- f- you're familiar with. As soon as you start getting into the uh, the classic One Piece backstory, as soon as like those kind of started becoming a thing, yeah. I realized yeah. I'm like, wow, this is yeah. something special. This isn't yeah, just really, yeah. this isn't just kind of like you know, the turn your brain off, you know, uh, entertainment. I I thought there was this the, there was just this level of. Uh, I don't want to say maturity, but just this, you know, sincerity, just this human element to it. And I thought, wow, something so over the top could also be so human. Uh, that's what. Such a rare, that's, that's such a rare thing to pull off, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, that, that, that combination is so rare. And, and then, and then certainly, you know, the timing wise was really interesting as well, because, you know, it happened to be that I was getting sent, the world was in a, you know, it's we're in a kind of dark, dark place in the world at times, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I seem to be getting sent a lot of, you know, apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear apocalyptic kind of scripts or, you know, the world being moved to another planet because we kind of burnt this planet out. and That's too been, real. <laughs> yeah, it's too, and, and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, yeah. and then this show comes along and with this character who's just kind of, you know, bursts out of every single scene um, that is so optimistic and so positive. And, and, and I just, because I'd shot black sails. So I knew the, the ships in, 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 in South Africa where we were planning to shoot, you know, and, 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 and I, and I know those locations and I know how you can create sparkle and flare and sunshine and blue skies and blue seas and, and wind and sails and all. I knew I could see how we could make 
a show that was very different to black sails on those same ships and in a world that was calling for some warmth and some heart and some positivity and some sincerity but not taking itself too seriously i felt like that was a really potentially winning combination and provided that we were all as a team um sailing in the right in the same direction we potentially could make something um iconic and and as you said like I'm I'm thinking of two backstories that haven't that aren't in the live action yet. The next I think the next two. And it's just it is crazy how absolutely um sincere and de- depressing and awful that those those situations could be and yet within this this wacky world where also there is that level of sincerity and, and optimism that we're missing uh just a real and, and, triumph of the human spirit kind of yeah yes it, it, it really is the triumph of the human spirit and and i because there is a choice involved and that's what i love so much about the luffy character and that's why i love so much about these backstories that um that we've touched on on in, in season one um because look life is tricky and difficult and there are dark times in our life and to a degree um you know without over um believing in the series you know these characters can show us that you can find ways through that that you can find you know positivity in that if you choose to do so and i guess for me as somebody who's been a storyteller all my working life you know the reason why i wanted to tell stories in the first place was because you know I remember as a four-year-old, stories teach you how to be human. You know, they yeah. that's why we tell stories. You know, you, you, you see a character and you slip on the shoes of the character and an obstacle is put in the way of what that character wants. And then you watch to see how how they overcome those obstacles to get what they want. I mean, you know, fairy stories, that's why fairy stories have lasted. You know, if you think about the classic story about the prince who wants to become a king. But first of all, he's got to slay the dragon to earn the right to wear the crown to be the king. Metaphorically, you know, whether it's becoming a, from a boy becoming a man or, or, or a girl becoming a woman, you know, metaphorically, you need to earn the right to wear the crown to govern. And so the prince goes after the dragon and says, yeah, I'm going to slay that dragon. I'm going to kill it. And then I'm going to become king and wear the crown and have all the riches in the palaces and all the rest of it. And so he does and he goes up and he takes his sword and he goes and he faces the dragon. He thinks, fuck, that's a scary dragon. Jeez, man, <laughs> did you see the flames coming out of its nostrils? Jeez, and it's huge. I think I'm going to be fine being a prince. I like it, you know, actually, I get to wear all these nice things. And okay, maybe it's not the biggest castle in the world. But hey, listen, I get the girl and whatever it is, you know. And then after a few years, he thinks that, you know, I'm kind of like bored. And then you get to the really interesting part of the story, which is he says, do you know what? I'd rather die trying than not try at all. And that then becomes the story of your life the fight of your life and it has to be the fight for your life and that's the story of of all of us isn't it you know when you want to realize who you are and become the person that you you want to become you have to face some dragons <laughs> and so the prince goes out this time around ready to lose his life and he has the fight of his life for this dragon and it's a real big fight and he slays the dragon and in doing so he now earns the right to wear the crown because he's faced his his dragons and he understands the frailty of human nature because of what he's just been through in fighting the dragon and he he earns the right to govern and in a way those stories you can apply them all the time you can apply that to luffy you know luffy was in windmill village he was alone he was on his own he he did whatever he could to get scraps of food to to, to feed himself and to become a you know a, um, a surviving human being and he meets shanks and shanks believes in him shanks says yeah you know you're a kid you're a good kid 
and he gives him his hat and he says, be a good pirate. Not be a good pirate, but be a good pirate, you know. Um, what does that mean? What does that, Luffy's got to discover all those sort of things. And those are the things that form him and they forge him. And, you know, that that's a really beautiful story. And from that, he decides, I'm not going to be a kind of um, a depressed victim. I'm going to go and get life. This is what I want. And he finds the people around him who, who says, I'm going to come with you. And absolutely. <laughs> uh, Sam, actually, I want to give you a chance to talk. I've talked enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess, like, the thing I'm most interested in is uh, what would you consider to be, like, your stamp? Like, what's what's your, like, artistic goal with, with shooting the show that maybe, uh, you know, a, a, another director would be interested in something else? Like, what's, what's, what's yours in this show? That's a great think? question. Um, and, and I think it's really important to ask as a director, especially when you're leading shows, you know, because, you, you know, you quite often get sent scripts and you think, yeah, yeah, I could do a good job on this. But, you know, so could so could lots of other directors do a great job on this. What is it that I particularly can bring to this show? And it's what I call your true north. You know, what is the true north that I feel I can lead this show towards? And I think it's a little bit about what I was just saying, which is that, you know, to, to give it a really clear purpose, you know, to, to give it a sense that this is about found family. It's about believing in yourself, believing in your dreams, supporting each other in those dreams, finding friends who will believe in them too, and be loyal to your friends. And those those are the kind of the big headlines of true north that i wanted this ship to continually steer towards and that matt and steve also wanted the ship to steer towards critically really important that we all felt that too and then visually there are lots of things sam um when you do a world building show on the screen it's usually incredibly complicated and very often incredibly expensive so you end up if you're not careful as a production spending all your time thinking about building sets traveling to locations um how you're going to realize this world in visual effects or not visual effects to reduce the costs and all your energy and time goes into that. And then at the end of it, you think, oh, well, and sorry, so who are the cast and where, what are the characters? And let's just pop them in there. And we can all think of shows where the world, when you see it on screen, is extraordinary. But in the end, the show doesn't kind of ignite because you haven't got characters that you can fall in love with. So for One Piece, I wanted to really reverse that way of thinking. And I wanted us all to start casting on day one. And we all agreed that this show would stand or fall on getting the right cast for it. So we cast, we were casting for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine months to find the right cast for this show. Because in the end, you know, an audience doesn't fall in love with the world or, or, or a set or a visual effect. They fall in love with people. And that's what I felt, and that's what Steve and Matt felt, that we had to spend our time on. We had to gather a cast together that that our audience would fall in love with. And so that meant casting for heart, seeing actors that whose heart came across when you were auditioning them, finding actors that had a certain kind of spirit to them that... You know, when you start putting them together and thinking, well, if that we put that person with that person, would that could that potentially work? So that, and this is all my experience, Sam, as a, as a theatre director, coming in, to that you can somehow try to create that mysterious other that takes place in in filmmaking, which is um, chemistry. It, it, it's a magical alchemy which y you you can't manufacture you know you can be the greatest director in the world and have the greatest scripts in the world and everything else but if you 
but it's really hard to manufacture alchemy and chemistry if it's not there. So what you have to do is you have to try and instigate that in your casting process. So those were really fundamental things. Secondly, I I wanted to shoot the action in a very particular way. Um, having shot, you know, a lot of very big set pieces in for Marvel Studios and for The Witcher and for Jupiter's Legacy, for example, um, which are pretty gritty, they're raw, they're visceral, they're dirty and sweaty and all those kinds of things, you know. When you look at One Piece, you think, ah, it, it just doesn't feel right for that. You have to find a new language for the action sequences in One Piece. And it felt more playful somehow, um, more more joyful. And and yet you have to and yet you have to believe that the stakes are still high, because otherwise you're just going through the motions. So how do you create a language and a style of shooting the action so that you can enjoy it? as being different to the Marvel action that we shot, um, but but equally not so different that you don't believe there to be a potential danger to them. And that for me was about um, fundamentally in the Marvel shows and in the Witcher shows, you're really all about the hit. So you're directing and you're shooting for the hit and you get that big punch across the face and slow like motion and the blood comes out and the sweat goes across the forehead and it all looks really kind of brutal. For me, One Piece was all about the journey, the dance, the choreography to the hit. I was less interested in the hit. I was much more interested in the choreography to the hit. So that meant a different language of camera work. It meant casting actors who, who could hold the choreography so that I didn't have to keep my actors for stunt doubles, which is going to mean a cut. It meant that I could do long, fluid takes that started on one character and then moved onto another character. If you look at the kind of the courtyard sequence in the pilot, in the pilot episode, you know, we do these lots of big, long sweeping shots that move around, you know, um, and then go on to the next character. So we weren't constantly having to cut all the time, which just kind of exhausts the audience, you know. Um, and then um, that then meant that I needed to have, how, how do we do that? Because very often when you're shooting action, you don't have the time to kind of, you know, to, to spend rehearsing the shots in the dojo or in the gym with your camera team. So you you get on the floor on the day, they've rehearsed it and you look at it and you think, okay, this is how we're gonna shoot this. Uh, I, that's not what I wanted to do with One Piece. So I managed to persuade Netflix that we, um, we should have a dedicated camera operator just to the stunt team. 100% only working with the stunt team. So they would learn the choreography of the fight hmm. with the stunt actors and then with, with the with our actual actors when they had time to rehearse it with it. And that's something that I learned from from The Witcher. When I when I was kind of um, shooting the Blaviken sword fight in the pilot episode of The Witcher, um, Henry had just Henry Cavill, had, who, who plays The Witcher, had just worked with Tom Cruise on Mission Impossible. And um, we were looking to kind of to really land a big fight sequence for that pilot episode of The Witcher. So we brought in the stunt team from Mission Impossible. Um, Wade Eastwood, who's a South African, and um, Wolfie Stegerman, who's a, who's a German, brilliant guy, as you know. And we brought in a camera operator and we just worked with that camera, camera operator on the, on, on the fight sequence. He literally spent, I think it was three or four, maybe even five weeks just rehearsing the action of that first section of that fight which was all done in one shot. And the reason for that first section of the fight all being in one shot is because I knew that the main action, which is the fight that he then has with Renfrey, I wanted to be able to cut and control. So if that first section of the fight, you're cutting up a lot, 
to get the beats. By the time you get up to the main action fight, the audience is exhausted because watching fights and bish and bosh and cuts and, you know, woof and ow and all that sort of stuff, you know, it tires you out. And so the main action was between him and Renfrey, who he just made love to that night before, who is now suddenly fighting. And all the time I wanted to be able to control that fight to be able to cut to so to go into some big close ups of the eyes and the faces to say, are they going to kill or are they going to kiss? Now, if I'd cut up that first section, the audience wouldn't have the energy to really engage with that. So we decided to do that in one big shot. So taking that into one piece, it was like, OK, so what are the main beats to these fight sequences? How do we choreograph them so that we can land those key moments? And so the courtyard sequence, for example, in the in the pilot episode is almost it's over five minutes long. That's a long fight sequence. So you have to you have to know what each moment is about and where you want to spend your key cutting time so we designed it in three acts that that whole fight the first act being the first moment when all three of them come together and we first and they, they, they you know zorro comes into the fight and then the three of them all stand there and it's like oh look there's the kind of beginning of our straw hat crew here and then the second act, which is when Axan Morgan comes in and says, I'm the motherfucker here. <laughs> you're going to fight, you're going to fight me. And so you have that fight. And then you realize that actually that is a big fight. And both Zora and Luffy are thinking, and Luffy's just being a silly little prick. You know, he's jumping in between the fight because he just wants to get, get involved. He's excited. And Zora says, oi, listen, listen, this guy is serious. So just stop that. <laughs> and then And then we had that moment with the bandana when he pulls out you know, the third sword, oh, that's where it goes, which is the <laughs> end of the second act, to get into your third act, which is, okay, we're into the denouement, and you go low and I'll go high, and bang, they 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 win the fight. So, so you have to have, in order to be able to design, construct, rehearse, and shoot those, you've got to have a good idea of how you want them to be. And that's a conversation with all your stunt team. Then it's a conversation with your actors. And it's a conversation that your camera operator, who who is working only with the stunt team, can have with the team to show how to, so that when we get onto the floor, they already know how to shoot it. There's a third thing, Sam, to your question, which is what, <laughs> what did I bring, um, which is that I really wanted the audience to feel like they were going to go on the journey with these characters that they wanted to be there with them. Oh, damn it. I want to be out of this room. I want to be in a boat. I want to be with these kids. I want to be in this world, you know, and traditionally, as you know, when you're shooting, you would do your wide shot. You'd show the world and then you move in and you do your coverage shots and you do your close ups and, and all the rest of it, you know, and that's fine, and that works, and it's a great tradition. But it is the filmmaker showing the audience the world. And if I really wanted the audience to feel like they were going on this journey with them, I needed my camera to be seeing the world as the actors see the world, as the characters see the world. So I asked our, our wonderful um, cinematographer, Nicole Whitaker, whether we could whether there were lenses that were wide lenses to be able to see the world, but also close focus. So you could be close with your actor, but also because it's wide, as you're close with them, you're seeing everything that they're seeing. And we talked a lot about, you know, what kind of lenses that might be. There are some mini hawk lenses which were used on the origin story of Jupiter's Legacy together. Uh, and then I loved the lenses that um, Jorgen Lanthimos used on, on a film called The Favourite. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. He uses big fisheye lenses, um, huge wide fisheye lenses. And I didn't like the fisheye in it. So is there a way that we could have those wide lenses, but take the bend out so we just had the width? And she said, oh, well, you know, let's see if we can get something made. So we went to the makers of mini hawks in Germany and said, you know, this is what we want. And they said, oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, let's um, <laughs> let's see if we can do that. 
And they made us these lenses, these incredible lenses. And we can come in and talk about that because there's there's a lot being talked about about the lenses. But that look has has two effects. One is it 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 allows us not to have to go back to the wide shot and then go into the close-ups because you're going with the actors all the time and you're seeing the wide shot with them. But second of all, it allows you to do what the manga does, which is kind of that, where you can get these wonderful framings where, you know, the fist is in the foreground of the shot and the body's further back or the foot's there or whatever it is because they're super wide lenses, but they're also close focus. I'll say, I think you found something that very few even avid readers know or I, we've discussed it in the past is that every time Luffy comes to a new island he does exactly as you described the Odasan has the big panel showing the full island or wherever they are at that moment from Luffy's perspective and Luffy's in the foreground and the so it's I don't know if you discussed that with him or if it was just intuition from reading it, but that's very cool how you were able to I mean, I'm sure it's just the director's eye on it, but be able to pick up on something subtle like that. Uh, yeah, because, you know, you know, our source material is the manga. And the fan base c comes from the manga originally, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. It's incredibly well conceived. It's. You know, it's it's the work of a, of a of a creative mind that we want to honor. We don't want to replicate it, because why would you? Yeah. It's already there. It's great. You know? <laughs> besides which, we're going into three dimensions, so we have to make some changes. But I want to honor it in whatever way I can that feels like it's going to work in our three dimensional world, and taking your your steer from what Odasan has drawn there is is all about that. It's all about not showing the wide shot and then going into your close-ups. It's going with your character all the time, being with your lead man, you know, and seeing it through his eyes because that's where the excitement is, you know. And then it's very much about applying that lens carefully because... You know, there were times where, you know, normally when you're shooting a show, I don't know how much of this you know, but you might be on a, your wide lens is probably a 28, then you go to a 35, 40, 50, 65, or whatever, those sort of lenses, you know. We were working on 8 millimeter lenses at times, wow. so 40 millimeter lenses, which is like super wide. And, and you have to be very mindful because there are some faces that can take the 14 mil lens or the 21 millimeter lens. And there's some that can't. Um, and, you, and there's no reason for it. It just is, you know, like, for example, with Luffy, with, with Inyaki, you know, he, he he's great on the 21 millimeter lens, not so good on the 14 millimeter lens, you know. So you have to be careful, you know. And, and, there, and there were some times where, you know, you're doing a close up and you get onto the wide lens and you think, no, 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 that's just too extreme. It's not going to work. And, and, and in actual fact, they're not fisheye lenses, even though there have been some kind of conversations in the social media about the fisheye lenses. <laughs> they're not actually fisheye lenses, but if you put them too close to the face, they can feel like fisheye lenses. So you've mm. got to constantly be mindful about the face that you have in your lenses. I remember when I was doing um, Luke Cage with Alfred Woodward, you know, the wonderful uh, actress Alfred Woodward. I mean, you know, you would never think of putting a 18 millimeter lens or a 21 millimeter lens usually on a lady. You just you, you just wouldn't. Um, very few men too, unless they're kind of you know villains. But she <laughs> could take that lens. It was incredible. Her face is so beautiful. She would take that lens, and, and I don't know why it is, but but that's part of the job of directing. You know, you you look at the shot and you say, well, is that is that working or not you know i have a lot to look out for on on the rewatch who takes the <laughs> eight millimeter one. yeah well, <laughs> well do watch because it you know it's quite clear it, you, you know there are times when you look at the lens and you just think i'm not sure that's quite right you know uh, <laughs>
and sometimes you just don't i think i think you had posted something like just seeing it all come together is also i mean obviously the visual effects weren't there when you were there and you have the blue screens in the back and you know i'm sure it's i'm sure it's pretty crazy seeing it come to life i mean in all your productions but in one piece uh here well you know the thing is we were from the outset really keen to try to do to as much as we could in camera um early 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 on you know we were thinking well what you know not just for cost reasons although of course cost this is a really super expensive show one piece is just a really <laughs> expensive show to make I, you know? i've heard <laughs> <laughs> well it's because it's kind of like a travel show really you know you never yeah. you don't have a precinct you don't ever come back to to one precinct which is normally what happens you know that's you think oh great let's make up a bit let's do eight pages in these precincts because you know we've been out on some crazy location miles away whatever it is you know you don't <laughs> have that um apart from maybe the going merry but the going merry is only taking you to another landscape you know so you've got yeah. to kind of build Escape. um so we wanted to try and do as much and, and but quite apart from the fact that again one piece to your point sam one piece for me felt felt like you didn't want to just rely on those those things you wanted it to be there's, there's something raw and realer about it that we were interested in capturing as much as we could in in camera um so we looked at you know a lot of buster keaton films um we looked at a lot of charlie chaplin and laurel and hardy um mm. and we looked at you know how they shot those because those are all done in camera incredible sequences you know how do they do that you know and then i remember richard bridgeland the, the production designer and i and nicole and, and matt and steve would look at these things and 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 then you if you if you dig deep you can find out there was a lot of models they used an awful lot of models there's a really lovely thing of charlie chaplin in a in a in a department store on on roller skates and he's rolling and skating up to the kind of the edge of this staircase which goes spiraling down like crazy and you think oh my god he's going to go down the staircase he stops just in time in actual fact it's just a flat flat floor but in the front of the camera they put a kind of spiral staircase so oh, wow. it looks like he's going up to the spiral staircase just brilliant stuff you know um so our, our kind of in, intention was to do as much as we could in in camera um and partly because as soon as you get as soon as you keep handing stuff over to visual effects you lose there's a danger you lose the vision because you know some of it's being done in nepal some of it's being done in india some of it's being done in, you know all over the world you know um and you don't you don't end up with the clarity of vision that you had when you were initially kind of shooting the scene so there were some very good reasons for it you know um so yeah so so but then finally, once you so, for example, that that early um, Logue Town scene with Gold Roger and the execution there, you know, I mean, that was just a tower in this kind of castle in the centre of Cape Town, um, with blue screens all around them. <laughs> now, at one stage, we were gonna we were looking to shoot that in a car park, with literally just we we built the tower, and. It was literally going, well, let's just, we're going to build all this anyway. Let's just shove it in the car park and put blue screens around it. And you think, oh, my God, these poor actors have got nothing to work with. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes, you you know, you've got to give them something to work with. Um, and we were doing all the corridor scenes in the pilot episode with, with Luffy and Nami. You know, when they're going down the corridor and they bump into Axan Morgan and all the kind of comedy that goes with that. And whilst we were there, we said, hey, why can't we shoot Logue Town here? These these walls feel like Florence, which is what Oda San had kind of modelled it on. Um, and it was a, we'd already built the tower. So, so it did mean we had to get these massive great cranes and hoist the tower over the walls of this huge great castle and put it into the center of the square of this this fort in the center of cape town where they'd just been shooting woman king with lots of straw all over the floor you know um but we did it you know and it gave the actors something to work with which i think was really helpful steve it looks like you have something to say 
I mean, I, it's a totally. I mean, like that was you know, so great to listen to, but I, I, I feel like now I'm like totally going to take it in a different direction. But something we haven't talked about yet uh, from episode two. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Is this buggy in general? You directed the buggy <laughs> episode, and I'm just curious what your <laughs> thoughts were working with that character. Um. Well, you. Had That's you the right of, answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. You, you, you know, if you look too far up to the summit of the mountain of Buggy, you just get terrified, you know, you, you, <laughs> because it's, it, you know, cinematically it's a really difficult thing to pull off. So you just end up doing step by step. And, and your first step was to find the right actor. And Jeff Ward came into the audition room. Well, he sent a tape in, actually. I think he sent a tape in first in full makeup. And it just, he, he, he came, he ripped his way through the screen uh, as Buggy just on his audition tape. And it was like, wow, wow, that's almost fully formed. Um, <laughs> not quite, there's a little bit of room for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But obviously we, we recalled him, we worked together uh, on the audition and, and he was just magnificent and he was brave and he dared, he dared that character out of his system. And of course you've got to do that with Bucky. You can't pull your punches. So then when we came onto set and it was an enormous set. I mean, Richard built this huge circus tent out of you know the idea was it was lots of reclaimed sails that he'd sewn together to create this big circus tent and we had i don't know maybe three or four hundred pardon oh sorry i I don't think that had occurred to me that that's what the the idea of the tent was yeah 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 the concept was the concept was all those stripes things if you look at them they're all slightly higgledy-piggledy the stripes, they're not all kind of uniform stripes that lead up. They're all slightly higgledy-piggledy because <laughs> the idea was that they were reclaimed, you know, discarded sails that had seen better days and were then... It's a pirate to show. The tent. Yeah. That's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's a fun take. And, like and yeah, but I, that was so brilliant about Richard. Everything, you, you know, again, we can talk about that because actually there was a lot of thought that we, we put into all that sort of stuff but um the 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 tent was huge and we had maybe three or four hundred extras just in in almost one third of the tent for that so for an actor to come on and own that space he had to go for it and early on you know in our first few takes you know um i just said to jeff just just go for it don't worry about anything don't worry about the words don't worry about the script just just a space because i you know having been involved in theater i i I know you you have to kind of feel the space so that's what he did he was all over the place with the script and all the other poor actors were going so where where is he on the script so which line is he on now you know really didn't know where he was going at all but it didn't really matter because he was just like ah he was just roaring this part you know and then you gradually come back to it and you say okay so let's just let's just give these other actors a chance <laughs> to find out where you are with this part you know um and you know he he gave us so much courage that we could land this extraordinary character because he so owned it and because he owned it a hundred percent and because he was determined to bring into that character um, some of the things that we talked about earlier on about the humanity of it, the, the kind of the relatability. And they're just little moments. It's not heavily lent into, but they're just those moments where, you know, he's holding the straw hat and he spits at that hat and says, Shanks, you know, did he betray you too? And you get that sense, this is a man who has experienced betrayal. 
and that maybe his his malevolence has a source that comes into a betrayal and then he turns to to luffy and then when he puts luffy in the tank and he's saying to him but come with me be one of my team and you know i'm going to be king of the pirates and you and you can be one of me and and then everybody will love me too and you think oh he just wants to be loved like everybody you know and 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 he found those nuances of character that 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 gave you courage that we could do something we could play the part in a way that wasn't just a big moustache twirling baddie you know uh, and Jeff was determined for it not to be that. And then, you know, the the cutting up into the little bits was magnificent, terrifying challenge um, because you could so easily get that wrong. Um, and and we all knew that, you know, and all the, all the Netflix execs came over and, you know, all the studio execs, Next came over whilst we were shooting those scenes because they could just see money being spent like crazy every day we were shooting these <laughs> scenes, you know, and and how on earth we were going to do it and was it going to work? And, um, you know, um, I'd worked with the VFX team before, Victor Scalise, who's brilliant, you know, I'd worked with him before when I did a show called The Runaways for Hulu. Um, so I, I, I knew him and I trusted him and we'd worked together before. Um, and... And we had all these kind of um, big limbs that we created that we were throwing at the actors so that when Nami was batting these limbs into the boxes and into the trunks, she was interacting with something real because you can do lots of things in visual effects, but what you can't do is create that kind of physical interaction. You have to generate that in, in live action. So these poor actors were having limbs being thrown at them and she would miss one and go again. And then it would hit it and it would land by her feet. And he said, no, no, I've got to go again. Bam, yeah, we got it, you know. Um, so that's what we're doing with that. And then and then it was really kind of putting in wind machines to create that kind of hair movement on, on Zorro uh, and, and Nami. Not that there was much hair movement on Zorro because he had the kind of, you know, the green um, wig on and all that. But but just to create that movement so that we get that sense of the whirring limbs going around, um, and 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 then you say to Victor, "Over to you, mate." <laughs> um, I should we ask our questions because I, I we kept you. I don't want to keep you too long, Mark. And it's been really. I could we could ask. I think a lot more, particularly about lenses. Um, <laughs> I like photography, um, so that would yeah. But Steve, yeah, go yes. Ahead. Yeah, no, Zach. If you if you want to ask our our usuals, you know, I think it's always yeah. uh, we get we get some interesting answers. Yeah. So we ask all our guests who come on uh, just some basic one piece related opinions that they have, um, and that's how we judge. You know, no, we don't judge. <laughs> but um, <laughs> well, I I will probably remember all these kind of things because I've been so immersed in in shooting yeah. the script that I have. Um, it's fine yeah, if go- the answers are related to the live action or the manga or whichever. Um, so first, easy question. Uh, who's your favorite straw hat? Now, <laughs> that's like saying to me, who's my favorite child? I know. Yeah, that's why I said I, it's an easy I question. I figured that's... <laughs> and and also, pick one. <laughs> I... I, I, I I can't pick one. Don't ask me that question. That's really <laughs> I just did That's that. really not fair because I love the actors so much and I associate them yeah. so much with the parts and they're going to think, oh, well, he didn't think I was very good because he likes that one more. And... Well, I'll, I'll try and give you an out. Um, have you read past uh, where you where you shot? Not really, no. Okay. Okay, mm. so I can't give you an out then, I would ask. Someone who hasn't shown up yet. Um... Chopper. Okay, there you go. That's the easy <laughs> answer. You got it. Um, that's also the right answer. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited by Chopper. Yeah, I, I am too. I'm very curious. I'm not going to ask any questions, but I'm very curious. Um, <laughs> uh, who is your favorite non-straw hat? 
These are your, I guess, not children, but extended um, family you'd have to choose between. Well, I'd have to say Buggy. I think a lot I of people to... agree. <laughs> I just feel like um, there's so much still to explore with Buggy. Um and I love the hints of it that we saw in in that in that episode two, and there's so much potential to still mine with that character, and also it's kind of like it's such a challenging character because you don't want it just to be another Joker. Mm, Do you know what yeah, I mean? It, 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 yeah. It's like you don't want it, and and we Jeff and I worked a lot on this. You know, we we don't we didn't want it just to be another I you know another it. We didn't want it to be another joker. We didn't want it to be another kind of crazy clown. We wanted it to be rooted in some, which is like what we did with all these characters. You know, when you look at the backstories, you understand Luffy, you understand Nami, you understand Zoro and all those different things. You know, his 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 loss with Queen, and those were big things in their lives. And um, and once you start to understand Buggy as a long straw hat character, you know, there's a great, fascinating, wonderful story there that I think a lot of people will relate to. You know, if you've ever been, if you've ever had a friendship that's really formed you and then felt like that friendship has somehow betrayed you, that's buggy. I think, I think you got him pegged on the, on the nose. Um, buggy, buggy is like, oh, no, was, by, con no, by contrast. <laughs> Buggy is like by by contrast with the rest of the series. Buggy is like kind of in a weird backwards way, kind of like the heart of the series almost. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's so true. interesting. Sam, say more. I mean, <laughs> not not to spot, not, not to get too much into it, but Buggy, uh, he's he's prominent. Yeah, throughout the right. the whole. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 an interesting choice for the live action to keep Buggy around for the well, most the of whole him. season. Yeah. <laughs> well, his, nice. but, yeah. his connection with Shanks and Gold Roger, you know, I mean, there's a, yeah. there's a mm -hmm. continuous line there, which is really, really important because we know that with Shanks and it's, yeah. it's hinted at with, well, actually isn't, I don't think it is hinted at within the buggy episode. I don't no, think I he does think, talk yeah. about Gold Roger, does he? He only talks about Shanks. Yeah. Yeah. So they did so, say yeah. like we were on a pirate crew together, but yeah. nothing about Roger. Too soon. Nothing, too soon to about Roger, drop no. that bombshell. <laughs> Spoilers um, for those who haven't uh, read. Beyond. Oh my god! No, yeah. but even there, there's even some <laughs> yeah, recent developments. We know with yeah. there's some there's been some recent developments with Buggy in the manga in the last year that just that very like ring true to what you just said about Buggy. So it's it, the the timing of this is you know something else. You um, know I. I just saw a friend of mine who has not read any One Piece, just loved the live action series, like had no exposure to the series before, loved Buggy in particular, and I described his uh, journey through the rest of the series as kind of like the Michael Scott of the, the what's the Peter Principle of the, of the One Piece, uh, of One Piece, and it's, and you totally, I think, I feel like that character is more fully formed in the live action because we have the the uh benefit of hindsight and and i also just i think jeff's performance um i i feel like you d definitely get that maybe not immediately but through the through the no, but i think the dimensionalizing of the character you know which is the kind of key thing yeah. that you do turning from two dimensions to three dimensions you know you're, you're dimensionalizing you're giving it an emotional life um you know if 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 you're just you know, if you're just literally taking a two-dimensional character and you put a two-dimensional character into into live action, you would have a lot of buggy in the manga up until he becomes more dimensionalized in the manga. But in live action, if you're gonna if you only have one episode to to introduce the character and then for the audience to kind of connect, you have to dimensionalize quite quickly. Yeah. And those are those beats that Jeff mined in the script that brought out those. Those, those bits that those relatable bits those bits that suddenly make, make you want to know more about him i i understand their constraints of money time personnel but i it would have been 
even more amazing to be able to really dimensionalize, um, which I know is way out of your hands. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the next question was going to be your favorite antagonist, but I think you answered that pretty well. Um, so what, what was the last one is what is your favorite, unless you have another, I guess buggy kind of falls somewhere in between, but do you have another answer to that? No, I think, I think I would still go with buggy because I think the great thing about buggy is that he's so fucking dangerous. Yeah. You know, he really is dangerous. You know, just, just because you have a backstory that gives you an, it gives you a reason to be how you are. doesn't mean to say that you are any nicer. He's still the only person, I think, in the manga, too, who's, like, actually hurt uh, Luffy's straw hat. Um, he, I, I think that in, in the manga, it's hard for me to remember because it was so long ago, but I but think also you get he, that. You know, he stands in front of the tank and he just watches him suffer. Yeah. You know, that's, that's nasty. He's a, he's, a, he's a nasty piece of work. <laughs> he is. He's a shithead, I think, as he'd say. He's, he's so silly, he's so pathetic, but he would kill someone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's silly, pathetic, and a murderer. Um, yeah. <laughs> the last question I had uh, is just, what is your favorite story arc that you have experienced so far? I don't know if I should make you not choose the ones that you worked on specifically, but it's open, whatever you want. I love Arabasta. Oh, so you have read a little bit past. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I love yeah. Cake. I, I love um, Whole Cake Island as well. I thought that was, you know, um, and Reverse Mountain. Or, I mean, I don't know enough to be able to pull out from those far away episodes, but I, I would probably say Arabasta. That's a good answer. That's a that's maybe the right answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people here. Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, Steve or Sam, any other? I, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but as I said, we could probably talk for a while. I yeah. think I had one, but it got away from me. Oh, the only thing that I, I do want to say, which is we kind yeah. of slightly touched on, um, which I think is interesting, um, just, just in production terms, because, you know, when you're doing a show like One Piece which is going to lots of different lands and you're essentially based in a, in a, in a, in a film studio, you know, I mean, you are, you are going to locations, you know, obviously for the for Zorro, Mr. Seven fight, we went to do a big forest and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, you, 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 you really want to try and define these different lands as being different. And I was really keen that we feel like each of these lands has pre-existed so that our, our straw hats arrive as guests in a world that has existed forever, that has a history, that has a heritage, that's been ancestral to so many different people. And so Richard and Matt and Steve and Nicole and I kind of talked a lot about what is it that makes a set or a world feel like it you are you are walking into something um that's pre-existed what is it about that and we and at one stage nicole sent me this this book called um homage to humanity uh by a photographer called jimmy nelson hmm. and um he basically went around the world photographing all the kind of indigenous tribes around the world that are still existing in, the, in their original form. And it's really interesting looking at the, the photographs because, you know, when you go to look at the photographs of the tribes of the Congo, and then you look at the tribes of the Aztecs in Mexico, why are they different? You, you know, what is it that makes those villages look like they just, the Aztec villages are just different to the Congo or or Bhutan or or the nomadic people of Mongolia you know and and it's not that we were trying to replicate that although Odessan has kind of created all these yeah these landscapes based on real places but what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the decay and the and and and, and what the weather had done and what the territory was and all those sort of things and then apply it to the lands of Orangetown or 
Kokiyashi Village or Logue Town or whatever it is, so that they felt, each of them felt like they had their own identity. To the point where, you know, our amazing props team, um, Egbert, you know, he was doing all these props and finding all these props. And there were times when we would go around the sets and we would pick up, you know, various different props and say, you know, so what's the story behind this? Why is this here? And and we were kind of just encouraging people to think about the stories. Oh, well, that was because, you know, my grandma had, you know, been to such and such a place and brought it back and it was her favourite cup or whatever it was. So everything had some kind of history to it. And 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 it and it made it feel like we were going into authentic worlds rather than just randomly constructed places um, for the sets for the purposes of the film. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it does. I I think when I oh Steve, no, I said makes pony. It makes yeah. pony sense. I think when I did writing in college, they said something like you need to imagine what's in this person's pocket that you're that you're writing about. Right. Like, and I. Yeah, and I think One Piece does that. I think it it exponentially more so to transition where you can't transition uh, in following um, once we get to the Grand Line because things are so isolated. I think that's a really interesting um, analogy in that also in the modern world, we're also interconnected. We don't really... we're. You know, for good and for for bad, there's just not that kind of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you know, you go into a shopping mall and you could be anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 in in our world, in One Piece world, if you're going to go to, you know, Kokiyashi Village, you want it to feel very different to Logue Town. You know. Um, I'm I'm what curious. Is why, why is yeah. It? No, I'm just curious how. I, I mean, look, South Africa is an amazing place with many, many different, you know, climates and everything. But um, some of the places in One Piece get really uh, extreme in one way or the other. And yeah, I don't think we'll be yeah. confined to, to South Africa for the. Oh, okay. The, no, I don't. I don't. I, I, I. Well, no. I mean, in the same way with The Witcher, you know, we were we were shooting in the Canary Islands, we were shooting in Poland, we were shooting in Budapest, in in, in Hungary. Oh, wow. You have to go. For the right landscapes and and um you you get what you can in south africa but you know we, we would probably do all the ship work in south africa because that's where they that's where we we built all the ships um for black cells um and and that's why we're there for for one piece but in terms of then landing on these different landscapes we'd go to i'm sure we'd we'd go to wherever the right place is to be so in a familiar refrain, Netflix should be giving more money to, uh, to <laughs> One Piece in future years. Well, you know what? From the very, very outset, you know, from from day one, you know, our, our great line producer, Chris Symes, um, who's who's the number cruncher, um, said to Netflix, you know, I hope you've got deep pockets. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is an expensive and actually, you know, in season two, if, if season one is kind of setting everything up, season two and beyond they kind of get more expensive don't they <laughs> yeah oh. i mean if you know if you've read any of the series it gets I mean, it only you know it only gets you know through. alabaster and that's that's no scuffle to say the least <laughs> could film no, it in I mean, Tunisia or... well, and, and what's the one with the with the, with the, the, on, the on the elephant's back um, oh so oh, so I, mean, yeah, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> you got to find a really big elephant and put miniatures <laughs> on the on the back. You find tiny little actors who can to... work on these. <laughs> I think we're set. Start 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 the selective breeding now. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah it's gonna be a long, a long casting session. To be fair, that's like what season ten. So we have yeah. a we have a few years before that yeah, would yeah. happen. Well, I know uh, but season ten, but you know season ten. You know, and let's just say at the very best, that's ten years away. You know, at our least, acts yeah. are going to be ten years older by then. You know, they're they're no longer the kids that they used to be. I, I was thinking about <laughs> that. I'm like, I guess you'd have to do it in a way where Inyaki could be 35, and and it makes sense. I I don't know. I it's I mean, as you said though, it's an adaptation. Um, it could go its own way in certain aspects, certainly, as as long as Oda just core... needs to give us another uh, time skip. Yeah, we we get a time, time skip, skip every year. 
Uh, there was a one-year time skip between each season somehow. Yeah. Um, Kiki's, just gotta, Kiki's just got to stay really young looking all the time. <laughs> I think he could do it. I, yeah. He has such a young spirit. I think that that would translate. Yeah. Um, we could talk about the actors for a long time too, but I want to keep you. You've been super generous with your time, uh, Mark. Uh, if you want to come on again when season two or before season two or whenever, uh, well, it's we'd great love to, to have talk you. to people who are interested and in, and know the show and are kind of, you know, genuinely interested in in discussing it. It's lovely, and so I appreciate your time and your your questions and any time, man, any time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great talk. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Not at all. Great to see you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Cheers now. Bye. Bye. Honestly, I think some of the people who like Ascend Asterion are like, I like, I get it, but I think they're like a little crazy because like, no, nobody actually wants like a crazy murderous vamp. Well, actually, nobody you know what? wants, Maybe. nobody wants Ascended Asterion. You want Raphael or you want Gortat. You just wanted an Asterion skin. And that's You're... like, I, I get oh, it. Uh, we're, wait, hold on. We're live. Uh, hey guys, yes. how'd you like that? Opla! <laughs> Opla! Look at Opla! <laughs> Y'all like that? You like that interview? Good interview? We had a good time? I think it we was had great. A good time. Pretty I insightful. You... Um... Really good stuff. I hope that Mark seemed to get on great with our uh, commanders, and I hope he comes back soon, because we absolutely loved having him. I feel I like wasn't so far there. everyone involved, <laughs> everyone that we've like <laughs> been able to talk to so far, is just so excited about like the series they're involved in um yeah and like that makes me so happy i I, i've had my criticisms about like some of the some of the stuff but it's just like you know whenever you adapt something that was meant to be just a a little comic and then it turns into an anime and then it turns into something live you're always gonna get like changes but uh i don't know yeah i I, I distinctly get the love went in yeah i distinctly get the vibe that like it's not too much capitulating to fans which i don't think anyone should be like obligated to do it does feel much more sincere where it's like yeah i don't feel like i don't feel like they're sucking ass which is something sure. that you always worry about like don't don't you really don't need to kiss ass with one piece fans just be genuine and i well, think that well, they love I mean, uh, one piece fans notoriously love to kiss yeah ass. actually but i i am you don't need I'm to not. call the man goda it's it's, it's okay <laughs> He's a it's dude. Okay. He's, a, he's a normal dude who lives in a puppet house. He is as human as the rest I, of us. I love his little puppets. That's I love his great. puppet house. I'm glad that if Opla did one thing for us, it was to give us access to his fucking crazy Guillermo del yeah. Toro freak house. And I now, love that Now, if Taz Skyler wants his ass, <laughs> I won't finish that. <laughs> no, Vero, commit to the you can use, No, you can, there's a lot of things you can do with a, with a person and their ass. Um, like make fart noise. Delaney, edit that in. Anyway, um, everybody, please. En- I hope you had a good time. I was gonna say, please enjoy the interview. You already did. Go listen to it again. Um, we'll Go be back, back next week. We will have. I think we have another interview coming up. And Steve and I are going to discuss the Sanji episodes. Um, who better to talk about Sanji than Yurko and I? The the I I know Sanji I heads. Steve Yurko. I, Steve yes. Yurko, am looking very much forward to that. Smee, can you give me your best Smeeve impression? <laughs> My best Smeeve impression. Yeah. Lower your pitch. <laughs> in post. Uh, talk, in talk, post. About, talk about wrestling or something. All right. We'll, we'll send it off me as, me as true Steve. Steve, Steve Prime. Um, this has been Opla, so join us next week when... Uh, me and Vero talk about uh, Sanji and Taz Skyler's uh, gorgeous hair. Hair, <laughs> real Taz. Okay. His hair, his hair is like you know. I'm I'm kind of the expert. Uh, but see you next week, everybody from from Smeeve. <laughs> Bye.